Uh, you know, looking at some of the things going on in the world today, how many know that it's easy to lose your peace? I mean, I just read the headline and said the Taliban are moving into the capital of Kabul. They're just, when you get into world politics. And so all this stuff is on my mind, and that's just political stuff or, or national stuff or worldly things. But then you bring it down just to our nation. We're a lot of unrest going on in our nation. And then you bring it into our community. You know, and there's all kinds of stuff going on in our community. And then you bring it down to the church. We're just one church of many churches, but one church. And there's all kinds of stuff going on in the church. And then you bring it down to your life. And we know it's just a hot mess. <laughs> But we expected that, right? That's why you're here. <laughs> but the point is, is that, uh, is that you've got all, this, all these things. And so I was just, these things were weighing on my mind. And I've spent a lifetime reading the Bible. And I was reading the scriptures. And this story just popped up. And I want to give it to you the way it came to me. And I hope it blesses you the way it blessed me. And you the way it came to me. And I hope it blesses you the way it blessed me. And so I want to set it up with this scripture out of Psalms. So if you have your Bibles or follow along, but in Psalms 94, 12 and 13, uh, the, uh, God's word translation says it this way. It says, O Lord, blessed is the person whom you discipline and instruct from your teachings or from your word. You give him peace and quiet from times of trouble while a pit is dug to trap wicked people. I love the last part most of all. That's one of my favorite. That's why I included that verse. It just gives me such joy to think I'm not a wicked person, so that pit's not going to be for me. Amen. But uh, I just want to just call your attention to what God says. It says, Oh Lord, blessed is the person whom you discipline or you train and instruct from your word. And this one encourage you. The word of God gives you the boundaries to live your life by. And if you'll stay within those boundaries, God promises you peace and quiet or relief or tranquility. Times of adverse place, you get into the Hebrew of this word. It's like a shaking, a violent shaking going on. God says, if you'll let my word guide you, I, God, will keep you in peace and tranquility. If you'll let my word guide you. If you choose not to let my word guide you, if you're not letting my word discipline you or give you the boundaries, then God says you're going to be in adversity. There's going to be things coming against you. You're going to have some pressures. And so I was reading that. I was just thinking about it. I just thought, man, that's a great word because I was more excited about the pit being dug. That sometimes, sometimes you go through adversity and you think, well, it shouldn't last long and it seems like it continues on and continues on and continues on. But a lot of times, sometimes the Lord is just getting things set so that he can take care of the people who are contrary and have decided to be rebellious and independent and go against his will. God says a pit's being dug for them. So for some of you who feel like you've been tormented, you've been abused, that God's not hearing your prayer, that as you pray, as you seek God, and you're seeking the Lord, and the situations in your life don't seem to be getting better, they seem to be getting worse, all I can tell you is you take Psalms 9413, the pit is being dug. And you can just stand on that, because I'm telling you, God is a God of justice. And that's what is so, in some ways, frightening, and sometimes, is because he is a just God. And every person gets, the Bible says, the fruit of their mouth, the action of their lives. The Bible's very clear that God's a very just God. And he's not going to, if you would, spare or turn a blind eye to certain things. And we know that as people of God. And so I believe, as, the, as Peter wrote, he says that judgment starts first where? In the house of God. The people of God. God tells us that not so much when we say judgment, it's more like the discipline. The Lord begins to correct us. If you, have a, if you are thinking, you got stinking thinking in your mind, or you or you got wrong speech coming out of your mouth, or your heart motives are going in a different direction, the Lord as a loving Father will guide you and draw you back to himself. So when he talks about judgment starts in the house of God, he's talking about getting the things out of our lives that are not pleasing to him. And that's what we want. 
Did you know that when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, and we're supposing that everybody here has either on that journey looking to give their life to Christ, or you've made that decision to give your life to Christ, and you're following him, but the idea so much is not to get you to heaven, but to make you into the very image of his son, Jesus. Romans 8 tells us that he wants to conform us to the same spirit, the same image, the same character as his son, Jesus. And I can just tell you, God has a lot of work still left to do in my life. That I'm not as close to the Lord as I thought I was in certain situations. And the Lord will show you things in your life. And if you've got a heart that says, I want to serve Jesus, you'll respond to his discipline in a way that pleases him. And you're not going to be rebellious. Or you're not going to be like a lot of people in our society that go to drinking and drugs and pornography to try to relieve the condition of their hearts. And I'm here just to encourage you. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to encourage you. God has a wonderful plan for your life. And you can trust him that he is getting you prepared for your next step, your next promotion, the next adventure, your next level of life. He's getting you ready to step right into that. Amen. And you can trust. Why is that? Because he's a good God. Amen. He's a good father. He has great plans for your life. And you can trust him. So I was reading this story. I was just in daily devotion, just reading through it. And, I'm, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a little different. I have, I have all my notes here. But I just want to read it to you out of the Bible. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Chronicles. If you can see in the dark back there. That's 2 Chronicles. Not Corinthians. 2 Chronicles. Chapter 15. I want to read this story to you. Because it ministered to me in such a way about the times that we're living in. And we are living in perilous times. We all know that. And I'm just going to read different verses here. Uh, let me just tell you what had happened in the previous chapter. Is that the nation of Israel had split into two kingdoms. Talk about a divided house. The house of Israel and the house of Judah became two separate kingdoms. They had two separate uh, realms, two separate ways of doing things. The kingdom of Israel was totally apostate. They completely went away from the things of God, the law of God, the word of God, the temple of God. They, uh, they consecrated all these worthless guys to be their priest. Uh, they had every kind of religion under the sun. That's what they embraced. And they were, quote, the people of God. And they had just gone completely haywire. Then you had the nation of Judah. And you read through their history, the lineage of their kings. And every once in a while, they had a good king that would really seek God and go after God. And then they have some bad kings. And they would just go through these, these, these reigns of good and bad kings in the nation of Judah. Uh, the nation of Israel never had a good king. They started bad and got worse. And eventually they just disappeared. And even to this day, archaeologists and scientists and all these people that study this stuff cannot find the missing ten tribes of Israel. They don't know what happened to them. And I'm telling you, go after God, don't go after the things of the flesh. And so they, uh, the tribe of, or the nation of Judah had a good king and they just had this encounter where they'd had a battle with Ethiopians. And it says that the King Asa had about half a million men to fight a million man army of Ethiopians and said they had 300 chariots and a chariot back in those days was like a tank. And the Ethiopians had all this firepower and God defeated them. And they had tremendous victory and they spent days as they conquered other cities and bringing the spoil in and doing all this incredible stuff. But listen to what the Lord tells them in chapter 15. It says, now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. How would you like to be in the family of Oded? It says, and he went to meet the king, met Asa, and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all of Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time, let's see, he gives a little history here. For a long time, Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest and without law. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. And in those times, listen to this, this is the key part. In those times there was no peace to the one who went out, nor to the one who came in. But great turmoil was on all the inhabitants of the lands. 
So nation was destroyed by nation and city by city, for God troubled them with every adversity. Let me just stop right here and just say, it says God troubled them with every adversity. When you read the Bible, you have to have the understanding when this was written, the full revelation of who God was is not given at this time. Does everybody follow this? Because I'm telling you, to be consistent through the scriptures, if you read that verse and say, okay, well, God troubled them with every adversity, you have to realize that at this moment in, this, in the season of the nation of Israel, Judah, that they believe that God controlled everything on planet Earth. And as we know through the teachings of Jesus, that is simply not true. There is a enemy spirit, a demon spirit, called Satan that Jesus tells us when he was in the final days of his life he says the God of this world comes and there's nothing in me the, the ruler of the prince of the power of the air and so Jesus identified the cause of what brings a lot of misery and adversity into people's lives and it's not God the father it's the God of this world but they didn't have that revelation back then. That's why when you read through the Bible and the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, there's a, not a lot of scriptures that deal with who Satan is, who the enemy are, demon spirits. All that stuff was kind of waiting until Jesus came and they were able to identify. So for the Jewish scribes who are writing this, they're recording this in their understanding, everything came from God. And so we know that's simply not true, but that was their understanding. So it says, uh, God told them, verse 7, but you... Be strong and do not let your hands be weak, for your work will be rewarded. And when Asa heard these words, now listen, so he's get this challenge. They just came off this amazing victory. The prophet confronts him and says, here's what God's doing. And it says, when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim. And he restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. And then he gathered everybody together. We're going to skip down here and we're going to look down to verse 12. It says that the, it says they, they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. And whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel was to be put to death. How would you like to be in that church? They would be put to death, whether a small or great, whether man or woman. Then they took an oath before the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting and trumpets and ram's horns. And all of Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with all their soul. And he was found by them, and the Lord gave them rest all around. The word rest, you can say, is peace. And we're talking about finding peace in today's climate. And I am convinced that if you're planted in the house of the Lord, peace should be one of the dominant qualities of your life. Amen. Rest, tranquility. It doesn't mean that you're unobservant, unalarmed by things going on, but you have the peace of God that controls your life. And when you read this story, you realize that what God was after was that there was idolatry in the house of God. Let that sink in. The people who said, God, we're called by your name, we're your followers, your believers. God says, okay, but there's things in your life that you love more than me. That's an idol. We can talk about that. We can talk about, like, when you look at, what do you get passionate about? And I will just say it this way. If Jesus is not the most passionate thing in your life, you have idols in your life. Okay, let me come over here. Maybe these guys, they're sitting in the dark, so I can't see them. So maybe they can. But if Jesus is not the most passionate thing in your life, is he not the greatest thing that ever happened to you, whether it be your marriage, your kids, your money, your promotions, I could go down the list of a lot of things. If Jesus is not number one in your life, I would submit to you, you have some idolatry in your life. Right. I would submit to you that Jesus wants you to be passionate about him. Amen. You know, I love sports. I love all kinds of sports. 
But when I get more excited about sports teams than the things of God, there's something missing in my life. When I'm more excited about my, I could just, I just go through just a lot of stuff. And God's like, no. It doesn't mean you can't have stuff. Let me, let me tell you another idol in our life. I could just, I could just go through the list. Let me, let's talk about, I won't make this easy. Let's talk about our cell phones. Since I bribe people with food, so we'll just. <laughs> but you can, you, can, you can list, you can see the amount of time you spend on your cell phone. Yeah. It gives you the count. Yeah. Whether you're up or down today from your average. <laughs> and how much time, this is not judgmental, I don't know you, I don't live with you. How much time do you spend in the word and prayer? And when your cell phone usage is 10 times the amount of your spiritual usage, I would say there's a problem. Can I get an amen in here? Is this just, everybody's getting all quiet on me. Like, I feel like I've, I've come into a, a room full of atheists or something like this. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to, I'm, I'm, I'm your fellow sojourner. I get it. And I'm, try, I'm trying to give you hope and encouragement. I think we'll get there. Hope and encouragement. That sometimes when you go through adversity, it's because God says there's some idolatry in your life and I'm trying to shake it out of you, which is what happens in times of adversity, a shaking, a violent thrashing, that God is exposing things in our lives to get it out of our lives. That's what he's after. Okay, we could talk, we could go, we could go further. What we're passionate about, things that were, you know, our possessions. You know, my wife, how do you spend your Saturdays? Well, thanks to bending her yard sale, I spend my Saturdays cleaning out the garage. <laughs> I get ready for church spending all day in that hot garage. Pull out all this stuff. I'm like, I wish you didn't have all this stuff. So we get ready for church. Why? Because we're getting our possessions. We're getting ready to depart from a lot of our possessions. Put them in the yard sale. The possessions, things that, you know, it's not, God doesn't mind you having things, it was things have you. And God's all about just letting you have all kinds, he, he's a father, he loves to give you good things. He loves for you to enjoy things. But here's to me, here's the, here's the litmus test, is that you're a steward. What is a steward? It means you're not the owner. It means I'm just, you know, the house we built, my wife built this house a long time ago, Live that, enjoy that house. And you can say, well, you own that house. Yeah, we own the house on the property. Yeah, okay. But one day we will die. If Jesus tarries, believe it, he'll come back. But anyway, if we, t if, he, if we die, that house will go to somebody else. I am just a temporary steward of those possessions. And God says, don't let possessions have you. We can do great things as a community of faith if we all just lock in and say, you know what? We're not buying into our culture mandate that my success is based on the number of possessions I have. I believe, I believe that God has greater things, greater values than by how many things I can possess. And there's nothing wrong with possessing great wealth. I mean, God, I believe Deuteronomy 8 God wants you to be wealthy, exceedingly wealthy, like Abraham, all the blessings of Abraham. I could go through a long list of things. There's nothing wrong with success. It's the attitude of sustaining that I am a steward. So you your possession. Now, there's another area in our life that I consider idolatry. You ready for this? We're going a little deep. But I think there's pride. And pride is this. Pride is I can handle it. Pride is where no matter what's going on in your life, maybe you've, got, maybe you've got a relationship that's on the rocks. Maybe you've got a child that's not acting correctly. Maybe you're at a place at work where that you're being required to get an education or go to a class and you're being really challenged about it. And, or maybe you could say that you've got a, uh, you're going through some situations where uh, in your social life and you're just being challenged to to not be involved in a relationship or in a social setting that's not pleasing to the Lord. And a prideful person says, I can handle it. I got this. And that's not, that, that's, that's idolatry. 
That's putting yourself in the place of God. And God says, that's not pleasing to me. So when you read through this verse about the people of Judah that had just come off a great victory, and the prophet comes up to him and he says, you know, let me go back and just refresh your, we read this earlier, but I'll read it again. It says, uh, it says that the Lord, in those times of trouble, that there was no peace to the one who went out, nor to the one who came in, verse 5, but great turmoil was on all the inhabitants of the lands. And the Lord just began to speak to me. You can always tell, Mitch, when you're with me. Why is that? Because you have my peace. And when you're in turmoil, you're not with me. And that's a great dividing line that you can use to test your life. When you're going through, when you're going through stuff in life, all I can tell you is that if God's peace is on you, you'll sail right through it. The adversity, the shaking, the violent, it's, it's, you're going to be okay. But if you have idols in your life, it will get you all shook up. I'm about to throw out a funny line here. Didn't Elvis just sing, I'm all shook up? You know, you get all, you get all shook up. And God's trying to, oh, you want more? Do I hear, do I hear more? <laughs> Break the tension in the room. I feel like there's this. It's just that when God's dealing with you, it's because he loves you. And he knows that the clinging to those, is it's all throughout Isaiah, all throughout the Psalms, clinging to worthless idols brings destruction into your life. It destroys the people who are closest to you in those relationships. You come to a place where you realize, God, if I'm in turmoil and I'm a follower of you, you, God, are after something in my life. What could it be? Am I full of pride? Are my possessions controlling me? Do I have passions that have stepped outside the boundaries of where they need to be? Jesus be in control. Now let me give you three promises that God gives to you if you will allow him to get rid of the idolatry in your life. Are you ready? These are good. I mean, these, when I saw these things, I got so excited. I just want to get to this first, but I had to lay, lay the foundation so you guys can enjoy this. When you've decided to make Jesus the Lord of your life, his peace becomes your peace. His shalom, his well-being, his the way he thinks, the way he talks, the way he acts. Jesus says, I am giving you my peace. And here's the results. The first blessing, you ready for this? When you have God's peace in your life, you become unstoppable. Listen to this. In Psalms 119, 165, Great peace have those who love your law or love your word, and nothing can make them stumble. Isn't that an incredible promise? Doesn't that make you just want to shout? Now, I know we're, we're not really that Pentecostal here, so you don't have to shout. But I'm just telling you, man, you get a hold of some of these things. God's peace in my life, it makes me what? Unstoppable. You ready for blessing number two? No, there's more, but I'm just giving you three. You become unlimited. Listen to this, Isaiah 54, 13. All your children will be taught by Yahweh or taught by the Lord and great will be their peace and prosperity. My prayer is the generations that follow me will walk in the ways of the Lord. My prayer is that my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, there's going to be a legacy of faith and our family line. Great will be the peace and prosperity of our kids. So you become unstoppable. You become unlimited. But this is my favorite one. You have to acknowledge, I love sports, so I had to put it in my terms, okay? You put it in whatever terms you want. But you become undefeated. Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan 
under your feet. Under your feet. Under your feet. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. We're going to close. We've got a couple of scriptures more if you guys can take it. Are you still here? Give me another two minutes. The Bible tells you this in John 16, 33. You ready for this verse? Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So what is the Lord saying to us? He's saying that in him you have peace, but in the world you're going to have pressure. In the world you're going to have opposition. They use it in the Bible the, the way the commentators were talking about it and the, the linguists who go through the Hebrew words and the Greek words and all this stuff. They're talking about it's like being on a bench press and you have, you have pressure coming against you. Or it's like crushing grapes or olives that you have this pressure. Or it's like taking, having a stack of papers and you're just pressing down on them. In the world, you're going to have this pressure. But you know, if you drop, I've been told if you drop like a can, like an empty soda can down into the ocean as it goes further, further down, eventually the pressure of the water is so great it can reduce it to the size of like a quarter. But you know what? If that can is filled, we found them all the way all over this. We're talking about all the plastic, all things all over the world, but you will stay in that upright condition. You won't be crushed by the pressure of the world. If the peace of God in your life is greater than the outside pressure coming against you, you will not be changed, you'll not be warped, you'll not be full of fear, you'll not be full of turmoil because the peace of God is what's controlling your life. Listen to what it says in the Passion Translation. It says, everything I've taught you is so that the peace which is in me will be in you. And will give you great confidence as you rest in me. For in this unbelieving world, you'll experience trouble and sorrows. But you must be courageous, for I have conquered the world. You know, the early church had incredible amount of pressure applied against them by the authorities. They had religious authority. They had the Roman government authorities. They even had just all types of opposition from everywhere. This is in Acts 4. When they came together, the early church prayed, God, give us the courage to speak your word boldly. God, give us the inner fortitude that when the pressures come against us, we don't collapse, but we stand strong. Now, God, deal with us if there's idolatry in our life, there's, there's passions, there's pride, there's all these possessions and stuff that just distracts us and we're spending all this time doing this. Just do what they did like in 2 Chronicles 15. Listen to what it says. It says, they took an oath before the Lord with a loud voice and they told the Lord that they were going to seek him with all their heart and sought by him with all their soul. And he, God, was found by them and the Lord gave them rest all around. Did you know when they came to this decision to put God first, we are told by scriptures, they had a 20-year period. They had no war. They had no turmoil. They paid attention to the word of God. They paid attention to the law of God. They paid attention to the things that God asked them. And there was great peace on their land. You see, I believe the shaking in our nation today is because we, the church, I will take the blame, we're not teaching people the word. We're not teaching people the law of God. We're not teaching people the boundaries that they need to walk their life in so they can walk in peace and prosperity. We're not teaching people the covenant that God has. He says, if you seek me with all your heart, I'll be found by you. And when I'm found by you, I'm going to give you great peace. And all your adversity and all your adversaries and all the people that are coming against you, they're going to disappear because I'm going to dig a pit for them. Because I'm being trained by the word of God. Isn't that encouraging to you? Okay, let's... I said two more minutes and I took five. Okay, music team can come up if they want. Let's do this last scripture. This is a promise that God makes to us as a community of faith. 
In Haggai 2.9, the Amplified Version, it says this, The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I shall give the ultimate peace and prosperity, declares the Lord of hosts. God says when you plant yourself in his house, you plant yourself in his word, God says, I'm going to give you the ultimate peace and prosperity. I, God, if you seek me with all your heart, I, God, will help you get rid of all the idolatry in your life. I'll get it out. And then I'm going to be found by you. And I, God, will give you rest on every side. Wouldn't that be wonderful to wake up every morning and you just have incredible peace and joy and prosperity to realize that God's got your life under his control. You don't have to be anxious. You don't have to be nervous. You don't have to be stressed. And then when stuff comes up and you get into skirmishes or battles, you can understand and come back and say, okay, God, you've told me I'll walk in your peace. You've told me that your desire would be your, that my desire would be your delight. That God, I can have a delight in your word, delight in your law. So God, draw my attention back. Bring me back to you. And all of a sudden, God begins to do these incredible things in your life and you're just amazed. I remember one time I was talking to a, a, one of the guys that was in our church and he was saying, Mitch, he says, man, I've gone through this divorce. It's incredible, all this stuff going on. He goes, before I met Jesus, I'd have been drinking heavily. He said, but I met Jesus and I'm going through this divorce and I'm not happy. But thank God I'm not turning to the booze that I used to turn to. Amen. I've had more friends and more situations where people have just gone through some incredibly hard circumstances in life. And they turn to Jesus and Jesus comes and they begin to walk with him and follow him with all their heart. And the next thing you know, his peace is ruling their life. His, his prosperity is a part of what they're doing. And the Lord has some great plans for you. But you have to let him deal with you. If there's things in your life that aren't pleasing to him, it's okay. We get it as a community of faith. There's no one here that thinks that we are the seal of perfection. We have this saying around here that if you're looking for the perfect church, you're in the wrong place. We're not it. Because we're a church full of broken people who've made mistakes, people who've made uh, mis bad judgments, people who've had different things happen, brokenness, but we found the solution is in Jesus Christ. We have found out that you can trust God, that you can serve God, that you can give your life to him, and that he will get you, and you still may make mistakes, but they won't control you, they won't devastate you, they won't ruin your life because he's going to bring you to a safe place. We find out through Celebrate Recovery and all the other things that we're doing, parents of addicted loved ones and grief share and all the other things, divorce care and all the things that we offer here, people are hurting. Our community is hurting. Our culture is hurting. Our nation is hurting. And God's looking for someone he can partner with. And I want to be that partner. How about you? I want to let God's peace control my life more than anything else. Amen. So if you guys will stand with me, I've got a couple of words here I want to share. If you're on the uh, ministry team, if you'd like to make your way forward, you can join me up front because there's specific challenges that I believe some people are facing in this room that I just want to step out by faith and just uh, kind of acknowledge to you. The Lord knows you, knows where you're at, knows what's going on. Let me just pause for a moment. And just give anyone in this room that has never met the Lord Jesus Christ. Or you're not, maybe you're like a lot of us, you maybe at an earlier age served the Lord and then like the nation of Judah, you kind of walked away. And God had to send, like in that case, Oded, uh, Azariah, the son of Oded, the prophet, had to come and speak and say, you know, the Lord says if you'll seek him with all your heart, he'll be found. And he'll get you rid of this anxiety and turmoil. Maybe you're in that state where you're just not for sure. Maybe you'd like to be. I'd just like to pray with you. So I'm just going to just say a word of prayer. and Maybe this will express on your heart a desire. You're here this morning because obviously you're seeking after God. You're here this morning because there's something driving you, something that's propelled you to want to come and give us this morning. And we're so thankful that you gave us your time. We want to do our best just to instruct you in the word of God and the things of God and Maybe you're at a point of decision, and I just hope if this is the time that you'd like to share your life and give it to Jesus, you can do it. You just say this prayer to say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to cleanse me. Jesus, I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. 
And that prayer just starts you on that path of commitment to him. Just like Judah where they said, God, we're going to seek you with all of our heart. Because they saw God with all their heart, God gave them rest for 20 years as a nation. 20 years of tranquility and prosperity and peace. Wow, what a joy. But I feel like the Lord gave me some words this morning and uh, we'll be dismissed in just a moment. But this might seem kind of odd, but I felt like there's a situation where it's a family thing. And I don't know if you already have children or don't have children. But there's this thing about pregnancy and just wanting to get pregnant. And I just hear a lot of, of tension in that, in that uh, desire. I encourage you with that. I hear the Lord also speaking to me about a family relationship that's brought a real crushing to your heart. Uh, I could get into specifics, but it's more I just sense a lot of, of hostility in the family relationship. And it's really crushed you. And I believe the Lord wants to bring healing to you and just get you free so you're not crushed in that situation. And then also hear about a business situation. So many years go through some business dealings and it's brought a lot of pressure into your life. And uh, I believe the Lord wants to give you his peace. I believe the Lord will obviously give you his wisdom. But I hear this about this business situation. It's just brought a lot of pressure on you. And uh, I believe the Lord just wants to free you to be able just to enjoy walking with him and letting him guide you in the path of victory if you have any other kind of conditions that are here physical conditions we got all kinds of healing reports and i didn't get into it this morning but the lord wants to set you free he wants to minister to you so we'll sing this song we'll be dismissed those who would like to stay around later uh, can stay those who want to prayer let the ministry team pray minister to you and the lord bless you so father i just pray for this congregation father i pray that let your great peace rest upon them Lord, we realize that in the world we have tribulation, adversity. But in you, Jesus, we have your peace. Father, I pray let the peace of God that passes all understanding guard our hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus' name we pray.